Welcome Peninsula Symphony audience. Um, I'm happy today to introduce uh, program note writer and um, musician of distinction, Larry Laskowski to the Peninsula Symphony family. Larry was educated at Harvard. He's a pianist um, at SUNY Manhattan School, um, City University, taught for many years at the Manis School where he was also Dean for uh, quite a while and is very active, has always been very active and published um, extensively in music theory. So welcome, Larry. It's so good to have you with us. Good to see you, Maestro. We are going to talk today about the Beethoven component of our first programs. The two pieces on this program are the uh, Fifth Symphony and the Leonora Overture Number no. 3, one of the th four overtures that he wrote um, for the opera Fidelio. Um, so where are we in Beethoven's life when all of these pieces are, are in his brain and in his pen? Well, I think we're right squarely in the middle. He's in his mid thirties, he's really hit his stride. He's, he's a, a public figure at this point. He's well known in Vienna. Uh, he's kind of a celebrity in a way that other composers hadn't quite been. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly extended period of like 10 or 15 years when he, he wrote a remarkable amount of music and all of it in a, just an incredibly positive um, revolutionary way that takes into account the past. He, he was a real student of music yeah. of the past. He, yeah. he knew things, yeah. but man, he was doing his thing and he was, he had, he had hit his mark. And all of this, despite uh, all of this productivity and, and burst of creativity, despite the fact that his hearing was mostly gone by now, yeah. and he was not happy about it. Um, not, not and, a happy person in general. Yeah, um, uh, he conforms. This period of his life is kind of the beginning of romanticism in music. We will 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 acknowledge that. And the Eroica Symphony, the third symphony that just came barely before this, was sort of the launching pad of that, where he bursts out of the classical uh, uh, restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, and all of this is happening at the same time. Um, we were mentioning the 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 Fidelio and the Fifth Symphony and the Sixth Symphony and the Fourth Piano Concerto. Um, you, you also mentioned a, a number of other pieces um, that, that are, are, are in his creative process right after that in 1803, 1804, 5, 6, and so forth. Yeah, that first decade of the 19th century, it was, a, it was a remarkable period for him. Yeah, and um, the size of the orchestra expands, the scope of emotion that's drilled into the, the musical fabric of a symphony orchestra is, is just wildly expanded. And, and uh, kind of the purpose of it all changes a bit. It shifts a bit. How so? Well, it's, it's not just, well, I, I, I don't mean to put down, you know, Mozart and Haydn and all, you know, mm -hmm. the predecessors. I mean, they, they created some of the greatest jewels ever made. But for Beethoven, he wanted it to be something different. And his, the strength of his willpower, he just said, no, I'm, I, yes, I get it. But I'm going to make this something a little different. And, and he did. And uh, music has never been the same. Yeah, it's it's much more personal. It's much more explosive. It's just bigger. It's more colorful uh, in in terms of orchestration, but also scope. Phrases are longer. Um, yeah. Ideas are bigger, and they relate to the outside world more. They're not in a yeah. jewel box. Um, he is opening up classical music to the world around it. That is, uh, um, Eroica is explicitly a political statement, um, one that sort of went awry, but nevertheless, uh, explicitly a political statement that that had not happened before, although Mozart's operas are sort of subversive in a, in a, a, a societal way. In a very sneaky way. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. But this is extremely overt. Yes, overt. And I think it's, in, in a way, it's kind of, it's kind of letting opera into the symphony hall. 
Yeah. You know, all of the emotion, all of the characterization, um, all of the storytelling. Um, and, I mean, this and, is and a, some of the exaggeration as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and the Fifth Symphony is a terrific example of that. And it had that impact. We're not fabricating what the impact of this was. I have a great quote here. Um, this is a review of the Fifth Symphony, not in that first performance. Oh, uh, let's just, well, well let, let, let me read this. Um, here's a review of the second performance, uh, the, the good performance of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Um, the, the author writes, glowing beams sh shoot through this realm's deep night. This is so romantic, this prose. And we become aware of immense shadows which rise and fall, close in on us and wipe us out, but not the ache of unending longing in which every pleasure that has surged in sounds of celebration sinks and goes under. And only in this ache, the love, hope, joy, self-consuming, but not destroying that wants to burst our breast with full voiced <laughs> harmony of all passions, do we live on as delighted visionaries? Okay. So that comes from the pen of nobody else but E.T.A. Hoffman. E. Hoffman, yeah. Now, of course, you know, we could we can laugh a little bit but that's a that's a listener who was open who was open to hearing in a new way and gets it yeah um it's just um i mean th that same reaction is the one that we have now uh, i hope so 200 years later yeah maybe um, in somewhat different words but it's the same thing yeah 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 we yeah we would be a little a little more coy about how we express it <laughs> but but it's also a good reminder that in literature the romantic period had been going on for a little while that's right that's music right. is always the last to find the new era mm -hmm. and it's true it's it's true today we're expanding our focus in music to the areas that have been neglected but that was true in literature 30 40 50 years ago and it's just well, it's, happening in music we're a little re retrogressive it's not a bad position to take actually yeah <laughs> that's right <laughs> absolutely so let's take a look at that uh, at these two pieces beethoven fifth um and see um how beethoven is so different from mozart and haydn um, I'm going to play a little bit of the opening, and this music is just relentless. It's furious. It's obsessive. Uh, you know that picture of Beethoven with the wild hair um, and the um, a personal uh, um, um, uncleanliness, uh, the this, <laughs> uh, crazy focus on on his music at the expense of everything else. It's all right here. So let's listen just to a little bit of that. So we have that material and it just goes on and on and on developing relentlessly. Here we go, just a bit more. Um, and even in the second theme, that's the beginning, that's the, the, the big material that we don't lose through the entire symphony. Um, even in the lyrical, relaxed um, uh, escape from that, here in the, in the bottom of this, uh, this is the second theme, you'll still hear bum, 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 bum. There is no escape. There it is. Bum, 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 bum. So, um, and then he finishes the movement um, with just hair-raising, furious uh, statement. So, and then um, it, it appears again in the second movement and appears again in the third movement like this. So this is, uh, uh, is there any example of a piece of music where one theme dominates the whole symphony um, before this that I, I can't think of one? No, I don't think so. I think this is a, a new thing. So it, this is a revolution. 
Well, it's kind of, uh, I mean, there's also a kind of a social revolution here where Beethoven is saying, you know, my predecessors, they were servants and they went in the servant's door and, you know, they served the aristocracy. And you say, no, 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 no. This is about me. It's yeah. about me and what I want to say. And I'm going in the front door. <laughs> right, right. And he was, in fact, financially struggling but independent. And he, and he manipulated his uh, commissions and his uh, publications right. um, uh, um, in a very modern way. He was kind of an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. And as you can see, it had the desired effect, as as E. T. A. Hoffman uh, tells us, and the audiences were were there. So um, this piece was premiered at a concert um, that was an unusual concert. Yes, indeed. So um, uh, yeah, tell a little bit of that story. Well, it was uh, it was one of those kind of mega performances that Beethoven. He had a bunch of new music that he wanted to put out there. And as an entrepreneur, he put together this concert, I think it was 1808, I think, yeah. in, in Vienna. Um, <laughs> a lineup that nobody would attempt to do today. It was a First blockbuster. Concert, the Sixth Symphony, uh, Perfido, which was a, a major piece with a vocal soloist, uh, several movements from the Mass in C major, the fourth concerto with Beethoven performing, the fifth <laughs> symphony, uh, Beethoven improvising and the choral fantasy. <laughs> Four hours. The, the financial implications of trying to do a performance like that. Right, but totally but he. Impossible. It was it was an opportunity for him to make a huge, everlasting splash, make a bunch of money, um, and there's also a, a, a reputed to have been a piece for violin upside down <laughs> on this program. So. Um, Why not? Yeah, he was uh, he he was the Barnum and Bailey of 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 his the P. T. Barnum of of classical music at that point. Well, kind of, yeah. And kind it of. didn't go it didn't go well that first. Well, he that had one concert. rehearsal. Imagine that four hours of music, and it was in the middle of winter, so it was freezing cold, and yeah. you know they did not have HVAC systems and um, and and extensive heating. But, you know, on the other hand, he got a bunch of great music out there and it did have a huge impact. Yeah. Even, yeah. even if the initial reviews were not great. Right. But um, in the second performance, by the by the second and third performances of all of those pieces, um, there was a little more rehearsal time and a little more refinement and and um, and those pieces became instant classics. They, they, they certainly did. Um, and think of the range here of um, choral fantasy, which is sort of the anticipation of the Ninth Symphony, mm -hmm. the Fifth Symphony versus the Sixth Symphony, which is a whole world. I mean, the outrage and fury of the Fifth Symphony and the gorgeous pastoral walk in the, in the woods that the Sixth Symphony is and that gorgeous Fourth Piano Concerto and, and then vocal music, a perfido, and uh, yeah, just an incredible... You know, world of music all premiered in one night. And, you know, you can well imagine that with one rehearsal, it probably didn't go so stirringly well. But on the other hand, I think it took a little while for the audience to be ready to absorb it. Yeah. Maybe they had to hear it more than once. Yeah. And, you know, there was no YouTube. Nobody could listen to it five times. That's right. Yeah. The, the way that uh, families eventually got to know the symphonic literature was that the composer would create a, a piano forehand version and publish right. that and you could play that on your on your little piano at home with uh, with the rest of your family all of whom played the piano by the way in those days yeah i mean at least in that social class and um so yeah um uh, uh, concerts were more special events because there was no other way to hear these pieces in their original right. form oh, amazing kind of and then there's the opera the house I was just going to say that contemporaneous with all of this is the opera Fidelio, um, his one and only surviving intact opera. Right. Um, and also a burst here. This opera is all about freedom, liberation, 
Um, it's all about uh, uh, unjustly accused prisoners and their liberation. And by the way, the hero of this opera is a woman. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, unlike Verdi and Puccini, the, the female hero does not get consumption and die uh, <laughs> because of her um, um, of the flirtatious nature. Um, this right. is, a, these are truly heroic characters. Right, right. And, you know, there is a bit of a heritage there with Baroque opera and the whole day of such machina and all that. But still, this is something quite new. Yeah, uh, you know, very, very related to contemporary politics. Very, very much. Nothing could be. And in fact, the San Francisco Opera is about to do a, um, a, a yeah. series of performances of this. And and I think it's not a coincidence that in, inaugurating their new conductor with this with this piece is all about that question of, of, of liberation and revolution and uh, freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a extremely moving moment in the opera Fidelio, which was originally called Leonora and then back to Fidelio and back to Leonora. And he tried all these different overtures. We'll get back to that in a second, um, in which these prisoners who have been unjustly imprisoned um, in, in, a, in a, 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 a dark um, cavernous uh, a cell for a long time, um, finally emerge into the light. And prisoners chorus the prisoners chorus and my mother was a dancer at the at the metropolitan opera in the 40s um in the metropolitan opera ballet and she was there when she heard bruno walter oh. stop the rehearsal of fidelio and talk to the chorus and the orchestra and the soloists and the ballet uh, about this moment um and what it must have meant this was Bruno Walter of all people, um, um, to have been imprisoned in this large group of unfairly, unjustly accused uh, um, revolutionaries or just victims, um, and to finally emerge after years into the sunlight. And um, so that uh, kind of gradual awakening that happens. Yeah, uh, it's immensely powerful, and yeah. this opera is immensely powerful. Even though he was not very good at the technicalities of of writing an opera, but but the the force, the power of this emotion is so overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, so there's a place. Uh, uh, okay, so there were four overtures. He tried and tried to write an, an appropriate overture, and uh, this is the best one, Leonora number three. But um, after he wrote it and used it, I guess he decided that it was just too good because the opening of the of the opera is is quite quiet and and slow to unfold. That to have such a a, a fabulous overture at the beginning would distract the audience. It kind of gives it all away up front. And this is how it does. I'm going to play another couple of little excerpts. There's a place in the opera where the sound of freedom, a trumpet call is heard and we hear that in this overture and here's what it sounds like. It's a pretty amazing thing. It happens off stage. Uh, it'll be interesting to see in each of our different concert halls where the where the off stage trumpet will will be. I think well, I'll, I'll let our audience find that out uh, as, as they come to the concert. <laughs> Indeed. What, what do you think? Sometimes that overture is played between the last two scenes. Yes, right. And I think that's a great way to do it because that that's emotionally where where it yeah. kind of belongs. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, the, the, the classic joke is um, the the stagehand uh, walks up to the trumpet player who's backstage and says, you can't play that thing here. There's a concert going on. <laughs> Indeed. Well, now we have the magic of video and whatever. Yeah, exactly. So uh, that's the offstage trumpet. Um, and then there is in in this overture, which, as you say, kind of tells the story of uh, of the whole opera. There is this headlong rush to freedom at the end with this wild, wild um, beginning of the coda of, of, of this Leonore number three.
all leading to that fabulous ending of of this overture. Yes, um, even the double basses can play that fast. If they can, yes, <laughs> yes, and that was boy, that was a challenge for the the the. That there were some great double bass soloists. Bottasini was uh, was active in this time, right. um, but uh, I think the average double bass player in your average German pit uh, or opera pit was uh, was going to be pretty challenged by this. Well, I'll just play every other note. How's that? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and you have this sense in that in that wild rush of of people just clamoring over each other to, to 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 get to freedom well you know the difficulty of the plane reflects the dramatic situation yeah exactly if it were easy it wouldn't be quite the same yeah that's right and that's what beethoven brings to these pieces the the, the fifth symphony and the leonor overture number three that could not have been imagined before his fevered brain got to this Right, 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 right. It's something that I kind of notice in classical music in general, you know, as you know, our, our players today, I mean, they're so incredibly skilled. I mean, there's nothing they can't do. But there's, it's almost a kind of a shame when they make it sound easy. Yeah. Sometimes it shouldn't sound easy, even if it is easy. Don't make it sound easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should sound frantic. It should sound wild. And frantic and wild are two of the emotions that uh, dominated Beethoven's life. His, his his disappointment in almost every phase of his personal life, right. and of course the worst tragedy that could happen to any musician, but especially the greatest creative force in the history of music, uh, losing his hearing. Even in this concert, this opening concert. Um, he apparently got lost a couple of times in 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 conducting because he just didn't couldn't hear the the softer yeah, places yeah, yeah. and you know i it, this may be a little bit controversial but i mean i know the ninth symphony is kind of in the late period but i i have always thought that the ninth symphony is kind of the culmination of the middle period mm. it's where he brought it to its highest point that he could it's different from the late quartets and the late piano. Scenario. Right. It's different musical language. Positive, outgoing Beethoven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Whereas, think of the the great fugue or well any of the late quartets. That's a completely okay. different musical language. Yeah. Um, yeah that yeah. really couldn't be appreciated at all for at least fifty years after Beethoven. Yeah, it kind of went into the archives and then came out again. Yeah, and 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 now we still find it challenging and uh, uplifting but these pieces um are still so thrilling to hear and to perform and so accessible yeah they're, they're right there yeah yeah so having said all of that uh we hope our audience enjoys the experience of hearing beethoven's fifth and beethoven's leonora overture number three um do take a look at the marvelous program notes that Larry has written that you'll see in uh, in our, our program book, on our online program book. And we look forward to seeing everybody in the concert hall on October 29th and 30th um, to hear not only these two great Beethoven works in which we're finishing our little bit of our celebration of the Beethoven 250, um, but also um, Rhapsody in Blue uh, with John Kimura Parker. Thank you, Larry, for this wonderful conversation. Look Thank forward you. I'm to looking forward to the performance. You bet. Me too. We'll see you all there. Thanks very much. All right. Take care.